moving the movement on, we want to turn our attention to the country of Ecuador, where Ola Beni is on trial and is, well, there's a lot to it here. Let me not try to editorialize. We're very happy to be joined by Zoe Alexandra from People's Dispatch, one of the best news outlets out there. And I mean on the planet, not in the United States, not in Latin America, not in Asia, on the planet. Zoe, thank you so much for being back with us. Thank you so much for that very great praise. Really, really means a lot. <laughs> well, I, I hope I hope it does. I, I'll I'll give you a little cheat code for our viewers. The Punch Out podcast that I do every day comes out at five p.m. You can find it on Spotify, Apple Music, and all your podcast areas. I don't know what they all are. Leans very heavily on People's Dispatch. I will not lie. <laughs> a lot of our great content is only happening because of you guys. So, it's not just praise; it's the truth. So. <laughs> Let me ask you this. I, who, Ola Beni is on trial in Ecuador. That we know. I think for most people who are watching this, it's probably like, well, who is Ola Beni? What is he on trial for? Why is this relevant? So tell us, who is Ola Beni and why is he on trial in Ecuador? Well, Ola Beni is a Swedish software developer and privacy activist, digital rights activist. Um, he had been living uh, in Ecuador for several years. And on April uh, 19th, the same day that uh, Julian Assange was arrested in the Ecuadorian embassy, um, Ola Bini was traveling. Uh, he was about to travel to Japan for a karate um, workshop. Um, and he was arrested uh, by unidentified officers in the airport in Quito. Um, they, you know, did not say why they were arresting him. They did not say what charges he was being arrested for. Um, and, you know, the, what really this arrest started and what followed was just a series of extreme legal irregularities, violations of due process. Ola Bini is Swedish. She does speak some Spanish, but he asked for a translator, wasn't given a translator. So really on April 19th, the saga essentially continues this horrible witch hunt against him, um, persecution, which today, you know, continues. And uh, essentially yesterday, uh, the trial began against him after year, you know, actual years of getting delayed, getting pushed back, um, judges being pulled off the case because of political interference. Um, and you're wondering, what was he tried with? So I think that's an important thing to bring up because, of course, that's at the heart of the case. But it is important to say that he was arrested and not really told what he was being um, charged mm -hmm. with. Um, and, as, you know, shortly after his arrest, the, uh, the Minister of the Interior, Maria Paula Romo, uh, she went on TV saying that they'd arrested Russian hackers uh, that they had been after, that had interfered with the national security of the country. And of course, you know, he was arrested that day. It was a, quite a public arrest, you know, quite emblematic being on the same day that Julian Assange was arrested. Obviously, he's not Russian. They were making allegations that he's a hacker, that he had, you know, you know undermined the security of Ecuador. Um, since And then beginning that day, he gets uh, put in uh, detention. Eventually, they reveal that he's going to be charged with attacking the integrity of computer systems. Mm -hmm. um, and they essentially start, there was, a, you know, of course, a raid on his house uh, where they seized, you know, computers, hard, uh, hard drives, USBs, all of the kind of tools that actually a software developer has. So, you know, if you are a woodworker and you raid the wood shop, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be equipment and the same thing. So they're showing these, you know, photos on, on social media, on the TV saying, look at this guy, he's the hacker. He, you know, did this, did that. Um, even books that he has about, you know, left politics, those were all used as part of this kind of media trial against him. Uh, he's being accused of, you know, accessing computer systems. This has really not been substantiated. Um, it's they claim and they've changed their story a bunch of times. They've actually been allowed by the judge to change the charges, change the explanation, and he attempted to break into the national telecommunications, you know, database. Um, but really, what this boils down to, and what you know, digital rights activists across the world, you know, people who have stood in solidarity with Ola for these past almost three years you know, have said that this is clearly politically motivated. He was friends with Julian Assange, did not work for WikiLeaks, did not, you know, have a professional relationship with him. But of course, you know, we can't, we can't start to say that WikiLeaks is illegal. It's a, it, you know, it was a, 
an organization that was doing crucial information. He was friends with Wiki, uh, with Julian Assange, knew him. And so essentially it's trying to, you know, show that Ecuador is uh, being hard against these people who, you know, dare to think differently. Um, and, you know, it's been a really unfortunate and very hard case to see because after three months of being detained, Ola Bini was released from prison. He was held in an Ecuadorian prison where he was also denied proper food. He's a vegetarian. He was not given, you know, the food that he needed. So many irregularities. It's actually hard to count. And he was released. And then since then, he's said that it's it's been like the prison sentence has continued. He has to go every Friday to present himself, show that he hasn't left the country. Um he uh, has been, you know, he's recorded that there's been surveillance outside of his house 24-7. Uh, you know, people who have been working on his defense team have been hacked. One of them has been, you know, under investigation. So it's been a constant harassment, constant violations of his basic rights, you know, as a human, as an activist, as a person. And uh, it's really representative of this, you know, rightward shift of the Ecuadorian government to just persecute um, those and, you know, of course, with the Julian Assange, I think this was a clear shift in their policy, which they had given, you know, him a, a asylum for many years. And so that's kind of the long, short summary of Olabini and his case and where it stands today. No, well, thank you so much for that. Very comprehensive and I think important to grasp all those different realities. I mean, you just you, you mentioned it there at the end, but I mean, it does seem that there is a relationship here between the government in Ecuador, its politics and what happened. Of course, the president at the time, Lena Moreno, the current president, Guillermo Lasso, uh, very close to the United States. And, you know, Ecuador, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is the case. I mean, not only had they given uh, asylum to Julian Assange, but they were holding themselves up as a government that was, you know, friendly to this idea of digital privacy and of an open internet and, you know, pushing back. It's sort of in the vein of what WikiLeaks was trying to bring to the surface here about the positive role the internet can play and not allowing it to just be dominated by corporate giants and, you know, governments and so on and so forth. Uh, and now it seems they're sending an exact message. I mean, I know you are not in the Ecuadorian government, so you can't say 100%. But does it feel like even beyond Ecuador that there's a connection between U.S. policy on some of these issues, of course the criminalization of Assange, and what the Ecuadorian government is pushing? Yeah, I think that's definitely right. I mean, some people have speculated that they thought they were going to be able to get evidence about Assange, and so that's why they were you know, persecuting Ola. I think they've realized that's a dead end because he... As I mentioned, he was a friend. He did not work with him. He's not going to be someone, you know, they could extract that kind of information from. And I mean, even just looking at the kind of work he was doing in Ecuador, he was just helping young activists come together. They, you know, I think this is very common in the tech activist scene to have like uh, crypto meetups and they discuss open source software. I mean, really basic stuff, you know, sharing information to more people, having a community of people who are working in this field. Um, and yeah, I mean, of course, that's something that's completely antithetical to the U.S. approach to, uh, you know, data, privacy, security, software. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the U.S. government loves to have their own uh, privacy about their information. But of course, you know, it wants to have complete access to citizens' information. I think Ola's work helping people protect their own information, personal information, whether it be politically related, whether it just be you know, not having your personal pictures have, you know, be in the hands of the government. I think that's a really, you know, valid and uh, important work that he was doing to help, you know, people understand what's at stake, under, understand kind of the encroachment of tech companies and what this means for all of us as citizens of this world. Um, so it's definitely part of this kind of pushback on activists who are just trying to help people understand this, you know, digital space that is constantly changing. You know, I know that uh, Ola Bini has been getting support from a range of different individuals and organizations really all around the world. It's actually quite impressive to see. And I know you've been uh, covering this pretty closely, Zoe, all of you at People's Dispatch. Uh, what are some of the biggest fears that those who are supporting Ola have in terms of what the, the implications and the repercussions can be, you know, of his arrest, of his trial, and if he is convicted of a conviction? Well... I'll just share a little bit about, so yesterday was the first day of the trial, and I think it kind of points to some of these, you know, what are the possible things that could come out of this? And so 
Um, yesterday started, uh, there was an expert witness of the prosecution. Um, and essentially, this expert witness was uh, going over some of the evidence that, um, you know, the Ecuadorian state has seized during the raid on Ola's house and, you know, during this whole investigation. Um, this supposedly expert witness uh, was saying, you know, that Ola had books that talked about hacking, um, that he had, that there were videos that uh, maybe referenced this, that there were some photos that, uh, you know, pointed to alleged hacking or, you know, talking about digital things. And I think, you know, that's clear what they're, they're trying to make a case that if you think, if you talk about anything software related, uh, you know, then you are a hacker, you're trying to undermine governments, you're trying to, you know, attack the integrity of computer systems. Anyone who's, you know, at all engaged in this kind of work can just easily be slapped with that label. I think this is extremely worrying. And that's why organizations, you know, like the uh, EFF, um, Article 9, a lot of kind of liberal NGOs that work with digital privacy have really rallied around this cause because they see it as such a threat to our, you know, right of expression, um, right to privacy, so many integral things. Um, and it's, you know, it's really unclear. I think at this point, what has been happening throughout the case is that they don't have enough evidence. And so, you know, they're constantly pushing, they're pushing, they're delaying, they're delaying. I think, you know, the bet what's likely to happen is that they keep dragging this out and make the individual Olabini make his surrounding, you know, circle just completely suffer because already it's almost been three years and he's just been in a constant odyssey of, you know, starting, stopping, of, you know, being in prison, out of prison, all of these different kind of ways of just exhausting a person and their dignity. And that's been basically the strategy. They don't have evidence. They can't convict him. There's actually no evidence pointing to this alleged thing that he did. So this is really their best option. Keep dragging it out. You know, keep getting people to say things that sound that are going to drive up media and say, oh, well, he might be a hacker. Um, and it's, it's, you know, very unfortunate that they're turning to these means um, to really, you know, send their message. You know, it, it absolutely is unfortunate, and you can see these types of strategies consistently use you know, sort of a lawfare sort of reality to it. And, I mean, what does this say about the current moment in Ecuador, too, and, and, and the type of government that is there, and certainly the one right before it, which was very similar, um, that this is happening? I mean, I think many people can remember Ecuador for so many years being one of the beacons of the the, the so-called pink tide in Latin America of, of, of governments and people's movements that were trying to change things for the better in their country. So what does this say about where Ecuador is right now? Well, I think with the, you know, beginning with uh, the Lenin Moreno administration, it's just been a complete setback in terms of rights, in terms of, you know, victories that people's movements won on the streets. It wasn't that Rafael Correa handed a bunch of, you know, things to the Ecuadorian people and he said, okay, here you have uh, some nice things. It was, you know, demands that were brought to the table from people's movements, rewriting the constitution, which was a process that involved, you know, broad sectors of society. And since Len Moreno took office in 2017, there has been a systematic setback against those gains. Guillermo Lasso being elected in, you know, last year, of course, kind of, you know, just further, uh, you know, con concretized this. Um, so I think it's, it's a moment of setback. It's a moment of, I think, a lot of the movements trying to figure out how best to take on the government. There were some pretty impressive strikes that took place at the end of last year um, of CONAE, which is the largest indig indigenous confederation in Ecuador. They have been taking to the streets against, you know, further attempts to implement neoliberal policy by Lasso's government. Um, other organizations have also been mobilizing students, trade unions. And so I think it's it's going to be the next four years are going to be, you know, constant struggle and constant trying to push back on these conservative, uh, you know, efforts uh, by the Lasso administration and hopefully rebuilding the strength that the people's movements once had in Ecuador. Well, like I said, People's Dispatch is not only covering this case, but covering quite a bit that happens in Latin America and around the world. Where can people find your work? peoplesdispatch.org and at People's Dispatch on all of the platforms that you may want to look on. 
Yes. <laughs> that's, that's 100% true, and including on YouTube, where I'm very honored to do a weekly 10-minute piece uh, with People's Dispatch. Zoe Alexandra, thank you once again for joining us here on the Freedom Side. Thanks for having me. Of course, pleasure is all ours.